So one place for us to start to talk about fatty acid synthesis is to see kind of like a three-dimensional picture of what the fatty acid synthase looks like. And it's actually pretty complicated. You can, um, I've looked, you can look under images in Google and everybody has, seems to have a little bit different artistic interpretation of what it's supposed to look like. But one of the ways that people look at it is this way. So there are two completely different fatty acid synthase um, complexes, kind of like in a head to tail fashion. And they sit kind of offset by a little bit so that this domain down here is close to the domain one in the other subunit. And so when we are actually doing the, the elongation by two carbons every time, we're actually putting the, um, these little acyl carrier proteins on and off from domain one of one portion of the fatty acid synthase with domain two of the adjacent one. So it, it's not domain one interacting with its own domain two, it's domain one interacting with domain two of its neighbor. And so it's a pretty complicated process, but it's actually pretty interesting, but I'm, I'm not gonna be able to do every single detail that's in there, but we're gonna do overall how it happens. And so, um, so as we talk about um, domain one, two, and three, think about this page, and then we'll come through and fill in all the details back on this page. So when we first, um, when we did <coughs> the fatty acid synthase, the description is it's a dimer of identical subunits, and there is a flexible connecting sequence and some people visually have it um, like a bean-shaped thing with three domains and a little tail, kind of flexible tail. And you can watch really funny YouTube videos of it where people have like a big blob of clay and then a little flexible tail and a little acyl carrier protein on the end of it. <laughs> so there are three portions that are going to be involved in elongating these uh, two carbon units. So we're going to do condensation, reduction, and translation. And it's all going to happen between the two different subunits. With domain one of the first subunit interacting with domain two of the second subunit. So I tried to do a description of domain one but as you get through domain one, you also got to talk about domain two. So it's kind of together in the same paragraph. But domain one has got the um, acetyl transferase, which is ATAs on the next figures. Malonyl transferase, which is MTAs in the other slides. And a condensing enzyme. And we're going to look at the carrier proteins where you're going to make a bond between the acyl carrier protein and, in this case, it'll be the acetyl group to start with. 
And that acyl carrier protein is actually on domain two of the adjacent subunit. So we said these carrier proteins were similar to what structure in our previous cycles? What was it similar to? Um, didn't it replace our acyl carrier? Right. So the co instead of coenzyme A, we're going to use this acyl carrier protein. And so if you look at the two structures, they're actually similar in some ways. So coenzyme A is down here on the bottom. And so the panathenic acid portion is in the, the black box. And we've got our sulfur right there on the end that's going to make the bond between our sulfur and the carbonyl of whatever it is that we're carrying. And so when we look at our acyl carrier protein, it has very, very similar structure to it. So we've got our panathenic acid. And then it's actually going to be connected to a big protein through a serine, the OH group of a serine. And so we're going to make that phosphate group linked right to the serine. And now we have a carrier protein instead of this portion of the coenzyme A, the adenosine portion of the coenzyme A. But the, the purpose is the same, that we're going to be carrying around little growing units, but instead of carrying them um, in a small molecule, we're now going to have this big, huge carrier protein that's going to stay associated with the domain two of the fatty acid synthase. So our two carbon units, remember, are going to be our, our, our acetyl-CoA will be our two carbon unit. And our three carbon unit will be malonyl-CoA. But where did that malonyl-CoA come from? What did we use to make up that malonyl? Yep, exactly. So we use the acetyl-CoA as our two carbon unit and add on one more from my bar carbonate or carbon dioxide, essentially, and we make our malonyl-CoA. So even though malonyl-CoA is actually a three carbon unit, we'll see eventually that all the carbons in that three carbon unit actually come from acetyl-CoA. So we also use this term loading. And so loading just means making a carbon sulfur bond so that the acyl carrier protein can hold on to whatever growing piece of chain of fatty acid you're synthesizing. And so the two enzymes that do that are the acetyl-CoA acyl carrier protein transacylase another word bank name, and then the malonyl-CoA acyl carrier protein transacylase. <laughs> but it basically just means to be an enzyme that's going to take the, the C double bond O off of the fatty acid synthase and give it to the acyl carrier protein. And we'll see those. We already saw that a little bit when we did our little slideshow. All right, so this is our, the overall 
uh, picture for two different subunits or two dimers, or a, actually say <coughs> a set of dimers for the fatty acid synthase. So domain one is the one that's in orange, and it's got um, the long chain acyl groups and the malonyl CoA will be binding in that region. So the first time through, that will be an acetyl group, so two carbons, and then that's three carbons. But the next time through, it will eventually be then a four, and then a six, and an eight, et cetera. So acetyl for two carbons, and then acyl for all the lower, the longer and longer and longer chains as you make it all the way up to 16. So domain two is down here in blue. So down here is where we're going to do the reduction of all of our long chain fatty acids. They're going to be working their way elongating here, and then we're going to be uh, reducing it. And then the last thing we need to do is just cleave off our palmitic acid once you're done, and they label it liberation of our palmitic acid product. So it's going to go down there in that green enzyme at the very end. enzymes along the way that are going to do it. Oh, first, we have to enter our acetyl-CoA and our malonyl-CoA. So one will enter it, that black arrow down at the bottom of the screen, and the other one will enter at the top. So we'll join in our two-carbon and our three-carbon unit will join in and join to the KSAs and the ATAs um, domain one section. So they'll come in from each end. And then we'll use our three different K, or KSAs, our ATAs, and our MTAs as the three enzymes to do our elongation. <coughs> and then we have little enzymes down here in the domain two. It's going to be our enoyl acyl carrier protein reductase, and then our beta keto acyl reductase, and then a dehydratase. And then the last enzyme will cleave off our palmitic acid. So this kind of looks like, if you do the stoichiometry of it, it looks kind of like if I, if I have one set binding here and one set binding here, by the time I'm done, I'll be synthesizing two palmitic acids basically at the same time. But I've seen descriptions that say that even with only one set of dimers, you can synthesize 20 palmitic acids at the same time. So to us, it looks like it's only going one at a time, but it's actually like constantly flowing, like a conveyor belt, basically, like shove them all in, produce them all basically all at the same time. So producing a lot of palmitic acids. So we need those palmitic acids to do what? What's our ultimate goal for synthesizing these fatty acids? What do we want to do with them? As? Right, so as triacyglycerol. So every three that you make is what oh, is only going to make one triacyglycerol. So you do have to make a lot more. It's not a one for one. You need three of those palmitic acids to, to make one triacyglycerol. 
So if we look at domain two, our domain two has our acyl carrier protein on it. So it's going to do our reduction on our dehydration reactions in domain two. And so our little acyl carrier protein has that panathenic acid on it. It actually has a phosphopanathenic acid group. And it looks really similar to the coenzyme A picture that we showed you a couple slides ago. So this um, acyl carrier protein is about 205,000 um, Daltons. It's got lots of alpha helices, and that serine is the one that's going to hold on to the phosphopanathenic acid group that will eventually attach on to our growing chain of fatty acid carbons. And then domain three, it's got a thioester. It's going to cleave off that last uh, carbon sulfur bond and releasing our palmitic acid. So we did this the other day. We can just go through it. You guys didn't have these notes in front of you. So what I kind of did was I tried to just show one of our, um, one half of the dimer. So we have our ATAs and our KSAs and our NTAs. And each of them have the functional group required to, in order to do uh, carbon sulfur bonds. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to attach our acetyl-CoA to our ATAs, and we're going to um, attach our um, malonyl-CoA to our MTAs. And so what's going to happen to this CO2 group? What happens to this CO2? So eventually, this, this group is going to become a carbon dioxide. It'll be a decarboxylation reaction. Because remember, we're going to be doing these two carbon units at a time, but we're using the energy of a decarboxylation to drive the carbon-carbon bond formation. So we're going to just put our coenzyme A's in solution. And now we have a group that's got uh, two carbon units on our ATAs and three carbon units on our MTAs. And notice we typically make oxygen carbonyl bonds or we make a sulfur carbonyl bonds. Those are good bonds for making and breaking through the enzyme interactions, through enzymatic reactions. So now we have our acyl carrier protein of domain two. And so that one is going to come up, and it's going to carry the two-carbon unit that was on ATAs. <laughs> so we make a new sulfur carbon bond. And so now we have our acyl carrier protein of domain two, and now it has a little two-carbon unit on the end that used to be the two-carbon unit of acetyl-CoA. And so now is when you get that little bit of flexibility. So imagine the little acyl carrier protein is kind of tethered, and it can swing over, and it now it can interact with the MTAs. I draw it really close together, but 
kind of in that 3D picture, it is a pretty big, uh, spatially uh, big to move. So it looks really small to us, like, oh, just shove it over a little bit, but it actually is a little swinging motion. So we're going to load up our KSAs with a two-carbon unit, <coughs> which gives the acyl carrier protein, uh, leaves our acyl carrier protein as back to being the thiol group. And now it's free to swing over and grab the, the three-carbon unit that's on the KSA, or excuse me, on the MTAs. So right now, our, our acyl carrier protein has the three-carbon unit on it. Remember, we've got that carboxyl group on the end that eventually is going to be the one that we do the decarboxylation on. We've got our two-carbon unit attached to KSAs and the two-carbon unit attached to the um, acyl carrier protein with the third carbon <coughs> as a carboxyl group. So here we do our decarboxylation reaction. So we're going to make a new bond between the, this pink methylene group here, which is the beta carbon to the sulfur of the acyl carrier protein, and making a new bond between this pink carbon and this blue carbon of the carbonyl, which used to be the carbonyl of the acetyl-CoA. So this carbon that actually gets released from this fatty acid synthase is actually used as the carbon that goes on to the malonyl coa So even though there's a decarboxylation reaction here, it is the same carbon that gets joined back on again on a different malonyl coa So you're recycling those carbons through. So you can say that every single one of the carbons that comes through from palmitic acid came from acetyl-CoA whether directly through the acetyl-CoA or through a carbon dioxide, which becomes part of the malonyl-CoA. So now we've got a four-carbon unit that has two carbonyls in it. And we know that at some point we're going to have to do some reduction reactions because we don't want those carbonyls in there. Again, eventually it has to be a long-chain fatty acid with just CH2 groups. So eventually we know that those carbonyls are going to have to go away. So here we have our NADPH to NADP plus reaction. So here's our reduction reaction. And I did it kind of all together. We do a reduction and a dehydration down to the methylene CH2 groups. <coughs> so now when we're, we're at this point, the only carbonyl we get to keep is the carbonyl that's attached to the sulfur because we need that one in order for us to continue to join the acyl carrier protein. So we do have to keep those carbonyls until the very end, and then we'll reduce those to the carboxylic acid at the end. So right now, I've got a four carbon unit here, and I've got a, the three carbon unit um, malonyl right here. So I don't I have anything here. So remember when we did the stoichiometry of this, we said one acetyl-CoA, and then all the other carbons were coming in the form of malonyl-CoA. So when we did the overall reaction, there was actually only one acetyl-CoA, and all the rest of them were malonyl-CoAs. So in the mechanism of doing this, the only time this actually occupies, the ATAs actually occupies it, is the very first time through. So once you get to this little four carbon unit, everything else now comes through playing with the MTAs. We don't use this that portion of the enzyme anymore. You know, they use it the first time through. <coughs> so 
So this is our NAD pH. So remember that that's going to be unique for fatty acid synthesis. So different than NADH. So now we're going to do, when we do step six, we put these two together. And now we're just going to go through and we're going to re go back to step four and repeat the same thing over and over and over again. So pick up the three carbon unit, join it up to do a reduction, join it back to the KSAs. The KSAs has the longer, the next time through, there'll be six carbons and then eight carbons and 10 and 12, all the way over and over and over until you're done with 16 carbons. <clears throat> so each of these circled steps, I did a little summary of what was going on on each of the steps. So when we do the next slide, then um, they'll follow the steps that are on this slide. So what's happening at step one? Oh, it's fading again. All right. What's happening in step one? I'm not sure how much you guys have. Um, so we make our acetyl-CoA um, bond to the ATA's subunit of fatty acid synthase. So we're making that carbonyl bond to the ATA's. And then the malonyl-CoA will go on the MTA's. going to transfer the two carbon unit from the ATAs to the KSAs. And then remove the two carbon unit off the ACL carrier protein and on to the KSAs, making a new sulfur carbonyl bond. And then move the malonyl CoA to the ACL carrier protein. And then condense the two carbon unit with the three carbon unit of malonyl CoA and do a decarboxylation reaction that now results in a four carbon unit attached to the acyl carrier protein. And now all we need to do is reduce the carbonyl and, and dehydrate. And now we have a growing chain of four carbons that are all carbon-carbon single bonds, except the last carbonyl that's still attached to KSAs. And then go ahead and add a new malonyl CoA and start step four. And keep repeating four, five, and six until you get to steps, until you get to 16 carbon. When we've got 16, okay, so that's a simplified version of it. We're not going to do any more sophisticated than that. Like I told you, my student goes, hey, I right, we spent two weeks doing that thing. But <coughs> we get the gist of what's going on. So we've synthesized a C16, okay? So what do we need to do with it? So we need to make a triacylglycerol. But in order for us to do this, we need to make some carbon, we need to make basically ester bonds. So a couple different paths that we can take. The first path is we need to generate glycerol 3-phosphate. Okay, so why glycerol 3-phosphate? What the heck? What do we need it for?
Okay. It's the backbone of the fatty if of the triacetoglycerol. <coughs> but the glycerol, the phosphate part is kind of interesting because as we add, so when we when we start with glycerol three phosphate, we can get it from two different places. We if we're in the liver, we can start with glycerol and just shove a phosphate group on it. Okay, so that one's called glycerol kinase. If we're in adipose tissue, we can use glucose as a source. Make dihydroxyacetone phosphate, you know where that one came from, and then synthesize glycerol 3 phosphate from that. So, why is this an acceptable route to take if ultimately I'm making a triacetoglycerol? What is, why is that metabolically an acceptable route to take? So remember, ultimately, we're going to be storing a lot of energy in the form of triacylglycerols. So if I have excess glucose, it's perfectly acceptable for me to start going down a pathway that will synthesize a molecule that will be a long-term storage for humans. So synthesizing the uh, glycerol 3-phosphate allows us to add two fatty acids using in the form of fatty, um, fatty acyl coas and then they can go on to the two carbon, carbon number one and carbon number two of the glycerol. Cool. So what would I do with phosphatidic acid? Now, I'm not going to, this can divert somewhere else. Where can that go? Or what can I do with that? You could use the phosphate group for something else. Yeah, but I got it on. It looks so pretty. I'm going to use it kind of like that, but just maybe add a few little things onto it. Maybe this is. Right, Nancy's. Di, wheel, phosphatidyl. Oh, wait, I need to add something on the end. Like choline or ethanolamine or something. So this is a branching point for synthesizing all the structural lipids, all the structural phospholipids. So I can synthesize phosphatidyl ethanolamine or phosphatidyl serine or phosphatidyl choline or whatever. But for the process that we're talking about, we want to go all the way down to the triacylglycerol. So we do end up having to chop off that phosphate group, leave the OH group, and add the third fatty acyl CoA. And then we eventually get our triacylglycerol at the end. So you do have this unusual branching point where you can take that those C16 palmitic acids that you just synthesized, and you can go on and produce the structural phospholipids. But for us, we're going to go all the way down to the triacylglycerols at the bottom because we're doing we're doing a, a lipid synthesis. <coughs> So the glycerol 3-phosphate can come from the liver or from adipose tissue in the form of glycerol 3-phosphate, either just a phosphorylation of glycerol or through dihydroxyacetone phosphate.
So our two acyl CoA's are going to go on to carbon number one and carbon number two of the glycerol backbone. And then modify our phosphatidic acid, put a head group on if we need to make a structural phospholipid, or just act, attach a new acyl group to form the triacyl glycerol molecule. You guys were so nice you did. You just left the box. Do like five more minutes and just finish this up. And these are the reactions that we just talked about. So you can just look at the strategy of it. So we've got our phosphate group. We put on our first uh, acyl, um, fatty acyl CoA compound, put the second one on. Then if you need to, take this one and divert off into structural lipids, and then take off the phosphate group and add the third one to make it. Okay, so let's get our perspective again. So we are now here, and so we have this section right here, and so we've got our acetyl-CoA, which came from citrate that can be um, excreted from or transported out of the mitochondria. And we've got our acetyl CoA, it's making malonyl CoA, it's making fatty acid synthesis, and then um, making our long chain palmetto wheel CoA's. <coughs> and then if we need to, we can transport that back into the mitochondria. So let's actually look at this section a little bit more. And there's a few little sites of regulation. So when I'm going from acetyl-CoA to malonyl-CoA, I've got citrate influence and I've got glucagon influence. So what will happen if I've got high levels of glucagon, what will happen to the enzyme that'll convert our acetyl-CoA to our malonyl-CoA, our acetyl-CoA carboxylase? So glucagon means what? You don't have glucose. Right. So when we've got low glucose, don't make fatty acids because that's a storage mechanism. So remember, this is a, this as soon as we make any of these, this is going to be storage mechanisms. So low glu low glucose levels is going to encourage. Things like synthesizing, um, synthesizing uh, glucose and beta oxidation will be encouraged. So low glucose levels are going to slow down any other storage mechanism 
like the storage of fatty acids. That's going to be counterproductive. So citrate, on the other hand, is going to stimulate it. So citrate is an indication of what? Right, so we've got a very active TCA cycle. That means I've got raw materials around. And so my raw materials are in the form of acetyl-CoA. So when I've got those raw materials, hey, don't waste them, make a fatty acid out of them. And so, now let's take a think I did this one. This is supposed to say palmitoyl-CoA over here, my little thing got chopped off. So what will palmitoyl-CoA do for my fatty acid synthesis? What will the, the amount of palmitoyl-CoA do? Wasn't it an acid inhibitor? It sure is. So what, so now look, what is this, what's this process when we do the ACO carnitine and then go into the mitochondria, what's that part of? What we did today on today's quiz. Right, so this is beta oxidation over here, which is gonna be the synthesis of energy. So what do you think that malonyl CoA will do to the ability to transport our palmitic acid in the form of acetyl carnitine. Because this indicates you're doing fatty acid synthesis. So what do you want to do to beta oxidation? Exactly, you got it. <laughs> I think I have only one more slide. And you can use colors. So make pink ones inhibition and make green ones activation. Oh, anyone need pink green? She's like, no, I'm not. I'm not I do, doing that. I need singles and singles. I'm not. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Hannah could loan me some too. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got. Why don't you guys draw them? And so the way I did it, I, I kind of just went like this, and I would say, um, so what influence would glucagon have on glucose to pyruvate? So glucagon means low blood glucose levels. So what is it going to do for glycolysis? It's going to inhibit. So why is glucagon going to inhibit this? Because you don't have enough glucose anyway. So please don't break it down. Oh, I see. So glucagon is indicator of low blood, blood, blood glucose levels. So don't, so please inhibit glycolysis. So what other kind of inhibitory things will glucagon stop? What's the one we just did today? Oh, yes, yes, this one right there definitely stops that one. Oh, 
wait, no, no, wait, no, no. Oh, over there is the one that I want. And we did the malineal coa on the previous slide. So where's malineal coa going to inhibit? Yeah, that's one. That one right there. And let's see. I think I have one more inhibition. I have what will fatty acyl CoA inhibit? It's like palmitoyl palmit CoA. So, high levels of this one are going to stop that one. So, don't make slow down your your uh, fatty acid synthase. and your acetyl-CoA carboxylase so that you don't make too much. Okay, so let's see, we've got some activators. I'm going to finish that up. Okay, so glucagon, what's it going to activate? Ketone bodies, right. That's a big one. Because we know once we generate ketone bodies, then we can go generate glucose if we need to. So that's a big one. And then the other one I have is this one. Why? So if you activate this one, what's this process in here? Right, that's beta oxidation, right. So not enough glucose, so go metabolize fatty acids. Okay, so what about our insulin? Actually, I don't have that one on mine, but it does. So I have insulin activating this one, citrate to acetyl-CoA, and then the last one I have is citrate activating the acetyl-CoA carboxylate. So high levels of citrate encourage fatty acid synthase and make triacylglycerols that way. Cool, that was